Good morning. Good morning. So Thursday, uh, Pastor Miller texted and asked if he'd be willing to teach that he wasn't feeling well. And uh, I kind of always counted a privilege to be able just to share the Word of God. It's uh, exciting. I love it. Uh, give you a handout. We're not going to go through all of it. <laughs> I promise. I promise. I, when I prepare for this, my wife will come up to the office and she'll look. She goes, you won't get through one page. So, but again, it's a real privilege to open up God's Word. It's a real, real privilege to study it. And what I'll share with you is what the Holy Spirit's working on in my life. I can only get excited about and I can only get motivated about what God is doing in my life. What the Holy Spirit is speaking to me about as I'm studying the Word of God. Now you're going to see some similarities. Um, I've been excited about the messages. Wasn't that a great message this morning? Mm -hmm. And again, I've been excited about the class that we've been teaching on the Holy Spirit. I shared with you last week and I'll just re repeat it. I did not know last week I was going to be teaching. But I'm going to share what J. Wilbur Chapman, I think some of you remember what I read last week. But my whole purpose here is to share with you what the Holy Spirit is working on in my life and to exhort and encourage you to consider what has been being taught in this church, in this local assembly. It's not an accident that the pastor has been teaching on, a, on the gifts of, this, gifts of the Spirit. It's not an accident. And Brother Miller has been teaching on the Holy Spirit. That is what this is all about. And it excites me. And, and when I read this about J. Wilbur Chapman, I can say this about me. I want the Holy Spirit to control my life. Amen. I want the Holy Spirit to have control of my life. That's why this study is so important. You're going to see at the quote that I'm going to go through, Dr. Ed Watke. Any of you ever heard of Dr. Ed Watke? He, uh, he, we were at a church in Augusta while we were there, and he was a member of that church, and I got to know him pretty well. Godly man. Godly man. Godly teacher, preacher. And uh, he shared a lot of these in fact, he, said, he sent me all of his files, gave me all of his files, and they're great studies. And uh, this is some of his stuff, uh, some of the study that he shared with me. But I've been using it. It just is, it is the only way we're going to have the greatest joy in our Christian life is being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God. Because if we're being controlled by the Holy Spirit of God, we are manifesting Jesus Christ in everything that we do. Because that's what the Holy Spirit's ministry is. And what's exciting to me, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself, so let me read J. Wilbur Chapman. And, and I apologize up ahead of time. I get excited. Okay? Now, I love that illustration. I've, we've, we've, I've used it many times about the football illustration. 22... Participants just desperately needing a break. 66,000 people desperately needing exercise. Well, when I'm one of those 66,000, I am really a fan. Okay? But when I participate, I really participate. So it's excitement that you're going to hear out of my voice. It's excitement that what the Holy Spirit is doing in my life but what he wants to do in all of our lives. It's possible. That's the beautiful thing about the Christian life. Everything that is shared with us in this book is possible. I can do all things through Christ. J. Wilbur Chapman said this, and he, left, he started out with this, this verse, a memory verse, and be ye not drunk with wine, we are in excess. But be filled with the, with the Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. In God's holy word, we are commanded to be filled with the Spirit. Pastor Miller talked about that. He gave clearly the definition about being indwelt and filled. Filled is being controlled. It's not how, I am not going to get any more of the Holy Spirit in 10 minutes. But the question is, how much of me does the Holy Spirit have? That's the controlling. Is the Holy Spirit controlling you? 
We all got indwelt by the Holy Spirit. We all got sealed by the Holy Spirit. How much of you, how much of me, does the Holy Spirit have? And you know, when those questions are being asked, your conscious and my conscious is on the person asking the question side. Because deep down inside, you know, we know how, how much of the Holy Spirit have. How much of me does the Holy Spirit have? In God's word, it command to be filled. To be filled with the Spirit is to be controlled by the Spirit. J. Wilbur Chapman, he shared his testimony. I, I, and this isn't in your copy. Um, he said, I've been struggling for five years. I mean, think about this. This is a great man of God. Struggling for five years. Preaching, teaching, studying, struggling for five years. He says, I've been struggling for five years. At last, I reached where I was willing to make a surrender. I simply said, I am now willing. Then he made the way easy. He brought before me my ambition, my personal ease, then my home, then other things came to me. And I simply said, I will give them up. At last, all my will was surrendered about everything. About everything. Then without emotion, I said, my father, I now claim from thee, and allow you to control me, Holy Spirit. Pastor Crockett mentioned it this morning. It was it's part of my introduction. I can show you my notes here. This book, and he referred to it, this book is relevant. This book is what was given to us this book was supernaturally written by the Holy Spirit of God. This book is what tells us how we can have success as a believer. Success might not be the right word. How we can have a spirit-controlled life. How we can walk worthy. I mean, that's how this whole series started. Pastor Crockett said, in using Ephesians, that we walk worthy of the vocation where we are called. We all have the same calling. We all have the same calling. The question is, are we walking worthy of it? Are we walking worthy of it? So, when we look at the book, this book is the word of God. It was written, it was not a concoction of their own ideas, of the writer's ideas. It was not a result of any human imagination, insight, or speculation. It says in 1 Corinthians 2.13, which things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. God did not give a general outline to some, of, some basic ideas and then let them fill in the blanks. This is divinely God, Holy Spirit inspired. This is literal. This is inerrant. This is our guide for faith and practice. People says that's pretty narrow. It's as narrow as that. That's it. How much time are you spending in it? Your conscience is on the Holy Spirit side. Answer the question. How much time are you spending in it? God talks to us through his word. We talk to God in prayer. How much time are you spending talking to God? And then once we've had that great conversation, we go out and talk to others about what he's doing in our life. I don't have a problem talking about how I adore my wife how I love my life, wife. We shouldn't have a problem talking and displaying how we adore our Savior. Amen. How we love our Savior. In preface, now we'll go through this and start looking at it. 
Are you a spiritual Christian? Are you being controlled by the Holy Spirit? How can a saint of God become a spiritual Christian without a vital, biblical, precious walk in the Spirit? That's the, you know, I don't think anybody in here doesn't want to say, wakes up in the morning and says, I don't want to walk spiritually today. I'm going to walk my own way. Let's see, let's see how much I can mess up. No. Christ spoke much of the person and the work of the Spirit of whom he said, I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another, another, and Pastor Miller talked about just a little bit ago, remember? Another. Another. There's two Greek words when it talks about another. One means one of the same kind, and one means one of another kind. What Jesus was saying here, he says, I am sending another, the same kind of comforter just like me. That's why he was telling his disciples, don't be afraid. I mean, think about it. I mean, seriously, I, I'm a picture guy. I'm not a cerebral guy. I try to picture a lot of things. I, I'm visual. If I want to figure something out, I got I to start writing it out. I got to put it on paper. And he started looking at this. I mean, those disciples are having Jesus Christ right there. When the storm came up in the boat, they go right and wake him up. Jesus, wake, wake, wake up. When they need something, when they see the healings, when they, see, when they get the comfort, when they get the strength, their confidence and their ability to keep going on was because they had Christ with them. I mean, it, 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 it would have been tragic. I'm leaving, I'm going. No wonder they ran to the upper room. No wonder they, they fled. But he uses, he says, I'm sending another, another of it, just like me. So when Jesus Christ finished his ministry, and I love this when I, when, when I think about, like, I think about everything. God created us, giving us life. Wow, he gave us life. And then man fell, but God provided a way. He provided a way. Okay, so he, he provided a way for man to get back into fellowship with him. Jesus Christ needs, but he, he provides it up. He provides us his book. Then he provides the Holy Spirit. And then he provides everything we need to pray. He provides us an invitation. He provides us a command, pray without ceasing. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Invitation, command, and then he gives us the tools. The Holy Spirit, we'll see later on. He helps us in our infirmity. What is our infirmity? We don't know how to pray. We're selfish in what we pray. Then, then he's got, then he has there, Jesus Christ sitting at his right hand, presenting the prayer to him. And then he tells us not only it's going to God, but it's going to our how much more Abba. We have everything at our disposal. I have everything at my disposal. How much are we using it? How much? I'm trying to encourage myself and exhort myself. And I'm sharing with you what I talk to myself about. When Pastor Crockett says we have gifts, and I see... And I, and I want to know how many people have been saved for how long and don't know their gift? It's not hidden. He's provided us a way to know and to use it. Wow. So, he sits down. He says, I'm going to give you a comforter. And you look at John. It's interesting. In John 14, where he says, it, it, there's a lot of promises. God, I mean, God is so good. Isn't he? Amen. Okay, I, I, I was afraid I lost you. <laughs> God is good. All the time. He's given us everything at our disposal. 
we're going to be without excuse. Right. <laughs> I'm going to stand before him and I'm going to give an account. It tells us that he promised us the comforter. In the book of John alone, he promised us the comforter. He promised us a prepared home. He promised us the that we could have power in his name in prayer. He promised us his peace. He promised us uh, sustaining life within us. He promised that the, his love, he, we continue in love. He promised us his friendship. He promises us our joy. God gives us all these promises. And what do we do with them? What are we doing with them? But he said, I'm going to give you a comforter, comforter of another kind. And then, who, and it says here, whom I will, um, and then he says, and he'll still testify me. John 15, 26, we are commanded to walk in the spirit. I oh, know, I'm sorry, in, in Galatians 5, 16 and 17, we're commanded to walk in the spirit. How can we become what the Father, God the Father desires without the power of the Holy Spirit in our life? As Christ came to pay for sin, to be our, to be our Savior, and has presently a ministry for us as the high priest, so the Holy Spirit has manifold mystery, ministries in our lives as the third person of the Trinity. He is now carrying out his ministry, this ministry in our lives as children of God. He is doing what the Godhead three planned would take place in us and for us. Do we recognize his work? Do we? Do we, do we cooperate with the Holy Spirit and his labor in our life? Do we? There are many excesses and false teaching that abound concerning the Holy Spirit and his labor within our life. There are, it's apparent, and, and this, is really, this is really it, it's apparent that Satan has endeavored to keep many from understanding the Spirit's work or to bring excesses and wrong that others say people might ignore the importance of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The devil does not want us to understand the power of the Holy Spirit in our life. He doesn't. We truly have an adversary, the devil, that's walking about seeking who may be valor. As a roaring lion. And he wants to hold us up. He knows. <laughs> I, this is the way I, he knows what apple to put in front of us to get our attention. He does. He knows what my problem is. He knows what I struggle with. And uh, it's amazing to me how many times that's what comes up into my path. I can tell you this right now, I, and I'll be, <laughs> impatience is, is, a, is a real problem that I have. I won't tell you the other ones, but I'll tell you. <laughs> and, you know, I, I've been, won't go into a lot of detail, but I've been praying, praying, and praying. And really, Rob and I have been really praying and seeking the Lord for a lot of things. And um, this last week, uh, I, you know, I, I manage a, a, a trucking terminal with about 80 some people. So we got lots of trucks, lots of things that can go wrong. Freight comes in, freight goes out, <laughs> forklifts, tractors, people. <laughs> people. And a lot of things can go wrong. And, you know, I, Things are, we had a great, we're having, we've had a great year. We've, God's blessed abundantly, abundantly. But it's a little foxes that spoil the vines. And it's one day, one thing after another just kept coming. And, I, and I'll tell you, it was, okay, Holy Spirit, I, I get it. I just pray. No, literally, I, I pray. I, say, I need help. Help me. Take a deep breath, okay, move on. And then, it must have been six, seven things. And honestly, they really, after investigating them and everything, it was, it really made no sense where these things came from. It made no sense. Other than the fact that it was, that my adversary was trying to get me 
angry. Well, you know, I had some, I have a, some medicine that I have to take. <laughs> and it's a prescription. And for whatever reason, every year now the insurance company says, oh, you got to get this renewed. We've been down this path before, so I go there and I needed the medicine. And uh, I said, you know, uh, I'll, I'll pay for it. You know, I said, well, how much is that? Well, $1,018. I said, I ain't going to pay $1,018. <laughs> I'll have a stroke and die. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> That's not what I said. I said, okay. And I, I really did start to get a little bit upset. And, uh, you know, I still had my, I still dressed in my company clothes. And I had the name of my company there. And then I kind of thought, I said, oh, man. I said, hey, hey, you know. <laughs> but you know what? I thought about the company rather than the Holy Spirit. I thought about the company rather than my testimony. Why is that? It all worked out. Fortunately, I thought about that, and secondly, I had my wife next to me. She was, <laughs> that's, that's, that's the help. I mean, she literally looks at me and she says, it's not her fault. But it's somebody's fault. <laughs> but do you see what I'm saying? When, we, when we're trying... We have an adversary. We do. So we'll go on. Look at this. So God wants us as children to personally know how, what a wonderful, spirit-filled life can be. You all know when you've been living in the spirit, when you've been letting the Holy Spirit control you, when you're praying, when you're in the word, when you are letting that word apply to your life, you all know how, what sweet fellowship and communion you have not just with God but with everybody else around you. Amen. Right? John 10.10 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's, <laughs> they, he wants to rob us. I am come that they might have life and they might have it what? Are you, we live in the abundant life or are we live in a redundant life? He came that we might have an abundant life. Not, it's not about being good. It's about being godly. It's not about being right. It's about being righteous. It's about being Christ-like. It's about being Holy, Holy Spirit controlled. That's what an abundant life is. William MacDonald, he says this in a, about that verse. He says, after we were saved, however, we find that there are various degrees of enjoyment of this life. The more we turn ourselves over to the Holy Spirit, the more we enjoy the life which has been given to us. We not only have life then, but we have an abundant life. Abundant, exceeding some number or, or measure or rank or need over and above, more than necessary, super added. I want a super added life with the Holy Spirit controlling me. That, that doesn't mean everything's going to be perfect, which we're going to see. It's not about possessions. It's not about position. It's not about prosperity. It's not about promotion. It's about the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives controlling us. What are we chasing? If you're chasing possessions, I don't know about you, but all the cars that I've owned have all died. Most of the stuff that I've had, every time I move, I get rid of it. You don't see a trailer hitch on a hearse. Possessions are nothing. Prosperity, the Bible tells us that money has wings. Position, promotion, the Bible says I must decrease so that he will increase. That's what it's about. What are we chasing? Are we chasing the real, available, abundant life that is available when the Holy Spirit has complete control of us. But life's not always wonderful. Even the life of a spirit-filled Christian is not always wonderful. 
It wasn't for Paul. I mean, think about this. This is Paul. I get amazed at that when I study Paul. I, I, I know we all do. I, I just get amazed because he is sitting there and he's in jail. I mean, think about all the things that happened to him. And we, we go through that through. But this is a man that, this is a man that was, wrote most of the New Testament. This is a man that was mightily used. He did not have a wonderful life. Quite the contrary. One pastor was painting a picture of how it must have been sitting there chained to the Roman soldier. But he just continued on. Why was he able to do that? He was controlled by the Holy Spirit. Those things are possible in our life, people. For this. It says in 1 Peter 4.12, following us, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering, that when the glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy, if ye be reproached for the name of Christ. Happy are ye, now listen to this, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth on you. How do you, how do you persevere in that time of a trial? The spirit of glory and the spirit of God rests upon you. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he will be glorified. Only if the spirit of God is controlling you. If the spirit of God is not controlling me, I'll revile back. I'll retaliate. I won't take it. It's not fair. The idea of rest of is the, is the this thing, listen to this definition from Strong's. The idea is to cause or permit one to cease from any movement or labor in order to recover and collect his strength. It's to be refreshed, to be kept quiet and calm, patient in your expectation. When the Holy Spirit rests upon me, that's what will happen when my prescription's not filled. That's what the Bible says. <laughs> That's not what I say. This is a mirror. This is a mirror and I'm looking into it. And when I look in the mirror, I try to clean up what is pointed out as a flaw or a blemish, something I can clean up. Matthew Henry says this, the glorious spirit resteth upon you, resideth with you, dwelleth in you, supporteth you, and is pleased with you, and is not this an unspeakable privilege? By your patience and fortitude in suffering, by our dependence upon the promises of God, and adhering to the word which the Holy Spirit has revealed, he is on your part glorified. Now, these definitions I have in my notes. I have to understand this. The man who hath the Spirit of God resting upon him cannot be miserable. Can't be. My afflictions will never be so great. I will be happy. The blasphemies and the reproaches which evil men cast upon me good which evil men cast upon the good people are taken by the spirit of God as if they're cast upon him and when good people are vilified for the name of Christ the Holy Spirit is glorified in them does the Holy Spirit have control of us we've been hearing I've been saved since I'm since I was 20 one. I'm 68. 40, what's that, 57? No, I'm 47 years old. So, 
How long have you been saved? How many messages have you heard about the Holy Spirit? And now my question is, is the Holy Spirit got control of you? What's got control of you? Most of the saved would say that the Christian life is a struggle. They might define it as carnal, fleshly. And you know, I find that interesting sometimes when we say, eh, you know, I'm a little carnal, a little fleshly. No, that's sin. <laughs> I'm trying to use a little dice little word. Hey, you know, I, I was a little carnal the other day. No, I sinned. You know, I sinned. I had the sin of impatience. Then I had the sin of anger because of what my impatience led to anger. It's sin. A life of ongoing struggle and defeat. For many Christians, something is missing. Many Christians say, I just hope it gets better. What's going to get better? Listen, we all have kids, right? Children. We've got four. We've got ten grandchildren. You don't need to raise your hand. You just answer, answer this question. How many of your children or grandchildren are living the way you'd like them? Okay? That's not going to make life better. We're still saved. We're still going to heaven. We continue to pray for them. We continue to lift them up before the Lord. We continue to be an example before them. We need to display the spirit-controlled life to them so that that's what convicts them. Because I promise you, if you talk them into something, somebody else will talk them out of something. It needs to be a spirit change in their life. That's why we need to have the Holy Spirit manifested in our life. For many of us, Christian life is a series of efforts. We try harder. We have good intentions. But poor follow through. Sin, suffering, supplication. That was what the Israelites were guilty of. They would get the victory, and then they'd go sin, suffer their consequences, supplicate, repent, and then get deliverance, and then they'd do it all over again. That's a redundant life. Sins of no, no abundance, strictly redundance. A charismatic congregation once advertised and said, we don't teach doctrine, we teach character. Well, you know what? That sounds good. But it's not right. It's not right at all. Character, maturity, our, our spirituality comes from the foundation of doctrine. Get your doctrine right and you'll get everything else right. And the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. Understand it. Apply it. Few doctors are more related than the study of the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. And the Christian is a full person when we apply that to our life. We must consider questions like, how do these truths relate to me personally? Are we asking that question? My biggest fear, my biggest fear is to not use my gifts to the end because our gifts are for the pastor said it this morning it's for the work of the ministry i heard it described this way one time if you go to ephesians 4 and you talk about the gifts the church the local church is where your gift is discovered where your gift is developed and where your gift is displayed first of all have you discovered your gift Secondly, have you developed your gift? Thirdly, are you displaying your gift? Pastor Miller has been talking and teaching and exhorting about the Holy Spirit. Pastor Crockett has been preaching and exhorting about the gifts. What difference has it made in your life? 
I read a paper one time, it was a quick illustration that says, really, I'm going to summarize it, I can't remember it all, but it's, it basically was uh, abortion, me, I get up, I read my Bible, I put on my suit, I go to church, I sing hymns, I hear the message, I say amen, I go home, and nothing changes. Nothing changes. Vance Havner says, this is what happens when people leave church. He says, some of you will leave mad. What is he? Oh, what did he just say? Some of you will leave glad. I'm persevering. I'm trying. Some of you will leave sad. I'm falling short. But the problem is the majority of us just leave with no change. We just leave and go back to the redundant life. That's a beautiful thing about being saved. At any moment when we say that we want to change courses, he's there to change our course with us. Course correction, that's what it's all about. When Robin and I ministered with the Reformers Unanimous, dealing in the shelters with all these individuals that had the, 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 the addictions, the strongholds in their life, do you know what their hope was? It's in the Lord. It's in, the, it's in the promises of his book that if you confess, he is faithful and just to do what? And cleanse us from all our righteousness and then allow you to keep moving forward. What has happened with these challenges from Brother Miller and Brother Crockett? Is it changing? Are you thinking about it? Are you contemplating it? Are you praying about it? Or is it just nothing happening? Introduction. Okay. <laughs> We're living in a day where, where the Holy Spirit is much talked about but little understood. Many excesses, false doctrines, and wrong ideas. The, the title of this section, the Holy Spirit. Do you know him and do we recognize our need? For many professing Christians, the ministry of the Holy Spirit is more experiential than factual. For the emphasis is upon experience and emotions. Many are more interested in some emotional experience or feelings that they receive from the Holy Spirit than the biblical actuality, the biblical teachings concerning his person and his ministry. Now listen to this statement. Spirituality is available to every, every saved person. We're saved on the basis of our relationship with Christ. But we become spiritual rather than carnal or fleshly, on the basis of a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Have you developed the relationship with the Holy Spirit? What is your relationship with the Holy Spirit? He is the another of the same kind who was left here in the absence of Jesus Christ. The disciples, after the Holy Spirit came upon them at Pentecost, they turned the world upside down. The Holy Spirit came and took the place of Christ because Christ is now ascended at the right hand and their relationship and their leading was by the Holy Spirit of God. What kind of relationship are we have, do we have with the Holy Spirit? Are you cultivating any relationship with him? He's the, another of the same kind who's here. And there is no jealousy amongst the Godhead. You're not, Jesus doesn't feel slighted when you call Holy Spirit Lord. Because he's called Lord in the scriptures. God the Father, Abba, which we can say Abba. Pastor Miller talked about that a couple weeks ago when we've been brought into the family as a mature son with all the rights. Abba, he's not offended when we're praying to the Holy Spirit. There's no jealousy amongst the Godhead. I think we just don't understand the Godhead.
I'm going to read a couple of quotes here. A.W. Tozer. Anybody ever heard of A.W. Tozer? Okay. We'll close with these. I told you we wouldn't get that far. Marks of a spiritual man. First is to desire to be holy rather than happy. Do you want to be holy or do you want to be happy? What, what, what's motivating us? God's word says what? Be holy for I'm what? The very word saint. All these epistles we're reading to the saints, to the saints, to the saints. What is a saint? We're made holy. Saints are holy. They're separated from something to something. The yearning for ha after happiness. I'll just leave it at that. Number two. A man may be considered spiritual when he wants to see the honor of God advanced through his life, even if it means that he himself must suffer temporary dishonor or loss. Such a man will pray, hallowed be thy name, and silently adds, at any cost to me, Lord. A spiritual man wants to carry his cross. We heard that this morning. Again, a Christian is spiritual when he sees everything from God's viewpoint. Another, and lastly, another desire of a spiritual man is to die, to die right rather than to live wrong. Mature Christian man of God is nonchalant about his living. Our tent's coming down if Lord Terry's is coming. Our tent will be taken down. We all know the quotes, only when life will soon be passed, only what's done for Christ will life. Corey Tenbloom said, I hold things looser so that God doesn't have to pry them out of my hands. What are we holding on to? Bible taught or spirit taught. Most of us are acquainted with churches that teach the Bible to their children from their tenderest years, give them long instruction in the catechisms, drill them further in pastor's classes, still never produce in them a living Christianity nor a uh, uh, an alive godliness. Their members show no evidence of having passed from death unto life. None of the earmarks of salvation so plainly indicated in scriptures are found among them. Their religious lives are correct and reasonably moral. <laughs> but wholly mechanical and altogether lacking in any radiance. No zeal. No fire. We're more excited and more talk more about the election than we are talking about anything else. Their religious lives are okay, but holy mechanic. They are they wear their faith as persons in mourning once wore black armbands to show their love and respect for the departed. And such persons cannot be dismissed as hypocrites. Many of them are pathetically serious about it all. They are simply blind. For lack of the vital spirit, they are focused to get along with the outward shell of faith while all the time their deep hearts are starving for a spiritual reality. They do not know what is wrong with them. And then this last one says, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Before we deal with the question of how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, there are some matters we must first be settled. As believers, we have to get them out of our, out of our way. Right here is where the difficulty arises. I have been afraid that my listeners might have gotten the idea somewhere that I had a how to be filled with the Spirit in five easy lessons doctrine, which I could give you. 
If you have any such vague ideas as that, I can only stand before you and say, I'm sorry, because it isn't true. I can't give you such a course. There are some things I say that you have to get out of the way and have to get them settled. Satan is opposed to the doctrine of a spirit-filled life about as bitterly as any other doctrine there is. He has confused it, opposed it, surrounded it with false notions and fears. He has blocked every effort of the Church of Christ to receive from the Father the divine blood-bought patrimony. The Church has tragically neglected the great liberating truth that there is now the ch there is now for the child of God a full and wonderful and completely satisfying filling and anointing of the Holy Spirit. So you have to ha be sure. Okay, this one. You must say, I am satisfied that, that this is nothing added or extra. The spirit-filled life is not special, deluxe edition of Christianity. It's part and parcel of the total plan of God for his people. We must be satisfied that it's not, not abnormal. I admit that it is unusual because there are so few people that walk in the light of it and enjoy it, but it is not abnormal. What Pastor Miller and Pastor Crockett are trying to get us to see is what the Word of God is trying to get us to understand. We can be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, God, for your Word, the truth of it, the power of it, the clarity of it. And we just pray we pray to you, Holy Spirit of God, that you would reach deep within each, of every, each and every one of us, pointing out the areas that need to be removed and the areas that you want. And that you, Holy Spirit, would challenge each and every one of us to identify the gift that you've given us. And that we would look for a way to use the gifts for the work of the ministry and that you Holy Spirit would stir up in, within us a desire for godliness for righteousness for holiness and a desire to die to self and mortify our members and to walk forth bringing glory and honor we pray these things in Jesus name Amen, Amen.